Thanks for being here, Mike. Well, it's a great honor to be here, and um, thank you for the retrospective. Of course, and since, we're, uh, since we get to spend time with you in the, in the context of this retrospective of your work, I wanted to begin by asking you about retrospectives. Um, uh, you just had one at the, at the BFI recently. F in full London, season. yes. Yeah. Um, and you're, you have one now. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit, you know, I'm always interested to hear from filmmakers about revisiting their past work. And th you, ta you touched on your relationship with some films in your, in your, uh, your body of work last night. But I'm, I'm kind of wondering, are, do you return to the films themselves uh, uh, ever, or just in, in contexts like this? Do I watch them? Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't watch them every night like Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I like watching them. I mean, I, if, they, if there's a reason to. I, I, I certainly... Um, I, I, I don't uh, resist or have the horrors at watching them. The truth of it is that I have the privilege, and I think it is, a, I'm lucky, uh, in that um, I like all my films. Uh, um, well, I say that because I, we all know lots of directors, I certainly do, who, if you say, refer to a particular film they made, and you say, do you watch it? And they say, absolutely not. I never want to see it again. Uh, it's a nightmare. Because... It isn't the film they wanted to make. They didn't cast who they wanted to cast. It was buggered about with by people and had to change the end and it didn't have the score he wanted, they wanted or whatever it is. And I've been lucky because I've never been interfered with in that sense. I've made the films I wanted to make, how I wanted to make them with the people I wanted to make them with, etc. So, you know, they are p pieces of work that I, uh, you know, feel comfortable with and on the whole I mean there are odd moments here and there in any piece of work you've done where, where you think we could have done that better but there aren't I mean I've just watched the last 50 minutes of this or something from the back and um, on the whole I wouldn't want to change anything really and, and um, because the fil these films um, aren't because I don't make movies about movies or because I'm not concerned with genres and stuff because they are about Im things that I and my collaborators care about emotionally. Um, I, I, I'm connected with them and I feel comfortable with them. And so when there's a retrospective, it's an opportunity to reflect. And, um, uh, but the main thing is, you know, uh, y you are a full house. Um, which is great, but what's even greater than that is that th there are a lot of young people in the audience, because one could be forgiven for thinking that only the old lags that saw this when it was first released would show up and see it, you know. So, uh, on the whole, uh, it's good news, and I am happy to be part of the celebration without it going to my head too much <laughs> to make it an unhealthy experience. <laughs> Well, um, uh, I, pretty much all discussion of your work, I, I, I feel, um, entails some discussion of the way that you, the way that you work and, and the way that you've made the films. And um, uh, I don't want to get too into the particulars of the methodology, so it's not to give away. I. Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to give, give away any trade secrets tonight. But, um, but I did want to ask a little bit about maybe the origin, the origins of of your way of working, and I'm, I guess I'm specifically curious about the influence of, of your training as, a, as an actor and, and your background in theater. Now, I think the way that you work obviously derives from, from theater in, in some obvious ways, but I'm, I'm especially curious about, uh, about uh, your having been an actor. Well, I, I, um, I trained as an actor, and very briefly, very, very briefly indeed, I did some acting. I mean, I have to say, the world is a better place for my not having <laughs> but carried on being an actor. Um, but, but the important thing isn't that I was an actor, but that I learnt about acting. And actually, I trained in the, at the very beginning of the 60s. I, it, I started training in 1960. 
um, at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London at RADA, which was at the time very old-fashioned and uh, prescriptive and um, dead, really. And there was no exploration, no improvisation, no organic discussion about you know, characters and background and stuff. Uh, and certainly, we never made things up. Um, and I reacted against that. But at the same time as being in that institution, it was the beginning of the 60s. And stuff was happening. Stuff was happening here in New York City, which we kind of started to you know, pick up. It was the zeitgeist. John Cassavetes, you know, uh, and all the stuff that was going on down the other end of town. Um, happenings and all of that stuff. Uh, living theatre and all of that. Plus, you know, I had never, um, growing up in Manchester, in the north of England, I had never, when I, until I went to London, I had never seen a movie that wasn't in English, in English, either a Hollywood movie or British movies, and I saw movies all the time. So again, when I hit London, I discovered world cinema. You know, it's the time of the Nouvelle Vague, and all those things were happening. Um, and so, there were, uh, and in the theatre, there was a lot of stuff going on, particularly the work of, of Peter Brook. So all those things were f kicking around, and I, um, like a number of my, uh, a small number of my fellow uh, tra trainee actors, wanted to write, and I had, in my teens, made things up and put shows on and stuff. I wanted to write, I wanted to direct, I wanted to make films, I wanted to make theatre, and I was fascinated by the possibilities of acting, and it gradually, quite swiftly actually, began to uh, dawn on me um, that the actor could be an artist. After I'd um, f trained as an actor and spent a, no more than a year doing some acting, I went to art school. I went to at famous Camberwell Art School in South London on the foundation course. And I, one of the important things about that particular training was the life drawing. And they really made you look at what you were drawing and think about, I started to learn and think about um, what being an artist is actually about. And I was, one particular day, uh, in the life drawing class, um, we were we, we were in. They'd taken over as an annex what had been a kids' infant school, and we were in this room, um, and we were all drawing the nude model, and everybody was um, doing their own thing. And I looked round the room, and I th there was an. You could have heard a pin drop. And everybody in the room was. L being completely creative and looking at life and finding a way of expressing it. And I th had this f clairvoyant flash, really. I thought, what, th th what is happening in this room is something that we never experienced for a split second in the, drama in the art, uh, acting school in uh, RADA, where it was just about, you know, learning the moves and the lines and not falling over the furniture, but not actually looking at life and expressing. And I started to think in that period, and I also went to the, I did some training as a theatre designer, which I felt was important from a visual point of view, and I went to the London Film School uh, for a bit. And, um, but I, uh, uh, apart from the having notions about how to make Films in, an, films in an organic way. I, I really was concerned with developing the whole no, notion of the actor as a contributing artist, not merely an interpreter, basically. Mm. And so I, during the course of the 1960s, though the objective was always to make, uh, make movies, uh, um, I, I, I made one or two shorts, uh, which weren't uh, much, very significant. Um, but I did a whole series of plays in various, which were mis... Um, they were called... It was a misnomer. They were called improvised plays, and my films are being improvised. And it make the, 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 um, th that sets up the myth 
that, it's, that they were improvised before your very eyes on stage, or that my films are ad-libbed, improvised in front of the camera, which is never the case at all. I mean, it's all absolutely distilled and arrived at in a very precise way through rehearsal, scripted through rehearsal. But the most important thing is um, th th that it, uh, uh, it, it, it is getting involving the actors to create characters and to put those characters together and to bring worlds into existence um, and then to dis distill the, the movie or the play out of that. And that's really where it all started. And and you um, you mentioned it, you mentioned it a moment ago, but um, uh, I've I've read in interviews uh, bef that you've done before that um, um, what, seeing shadows, the John Cassavetes film for the first time was like a, perhaps an especially well, formative. It, it, or it, maybe it, I'm making too much yeah, out of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's very curious because you know, I mean, when you look at it now, I mean, it's it's fascinating to see. It's not a great. It's not a great uh, disciplined, dramatic movie. I mean, it, it doesn't affect me that at all. But it wasn't so much... It, it was, as I say, it was part of all, all kinds of things. Oh, I mean, other things, too. You know, poetry and, um, you, you know, I mean, it, I, in almost, I think, within the first couple of weeks of hitting London, I mean, there was a massive Picasso exhibition. Mm -hmm. And that was a sort of, you know, a revelation. Again, Picasso ceases to be the most um, profound influence from, from the point of view of painters, perhaps. But uh, Cassavetes, at that point in time, that was refreshing, basically. Um, of course, you know, one has um, th the debate about Cassavetes uh, has went on and developed. You know, I mean, uh, 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 plainly. Um, what some of what he did was great, and some of what he did was not great, but merely um, its heart was in the right place. I mean, a lot of it, his work is about actors playing themselves and indeed improvising and just being them, letting letting it hang out basically. Um, for me, his best film is *The Killing of a Chinese Bookie*, uh, which is probably the least in that in the sense of what I've just referred to, the least Cassavetes like film there is. But I think I haven't come here to talk about Cassavetti. <laughs> <laughs> the Killing of Chinese Book is my favorite too. But, um, <laughs> but we'll move on. Um, yeah, well, uh, somewhat relatedly then, um, uh, because of the way that you, uh, that you work with the actors in this act of collaboration and the, and the formulation of, of, of their characters and, and so on, um, you know, I've I've heard you talk a bit about how that that happens, but what what I haven't heard as, or maybe I'm just not looking in the right places. What I haven't heard as much about is uh, is casting and sort of uh, your your how you approach this. Be given the given the way that the collaborations work, one would think that this is an especially crucial um, phase of everything for you. So maybe could you tell us a little bit about sort of your philosophy of of casting? Oh, I mean. Uh the, 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 the most important thing, <clears throat> the bottom line, is that I can and do work with character actors, which is to say people who don't play themselves, or don't just play themselves, but, you know, can do real people out there in the street, you, you, you know, and uh, not only can do that, but want to do that and are committed to it, and, you know. Um, so that's really what I, it's about finding those actors. I mean, uh, it's very important to find intelligent actors, and not all actors are intelligent. Um, no disrespect to those of you in the audience who are unintelligent actors. <laughs> um, uh, so I uh, spend a lot of time uh, talking to people and auditioning and doing stuff. I won't go into the details of how we do that, but it is about that. And uh, um, w when we sit down to create these works, um, I work, first of all, individually at great length and for a long time with each actor to get, a char get characters on the go, drawn from real people that they know. And then those, we put them together and build relationships. And, and it takes months and months before we so we arrive at a microcosm, a whole world, 
from which we are then able to distill and structure the, the film scene by scene, location by location in a precise way. And of course, you know, it's also about the collaboration of the cinematographer and the designers and the costume and makeup designers and so on. And, so. Mm. and well, then I, I want to sort of focus for a moment on Marianne Jean Baptiste, um, uh, Hortense in the film, um, who you were, you were, I think you mentioned last night that you, um, you, you'd actually, you wanted, I think, initially to cast her in Naked, right? Um, I didn't mention it last night, but I have uh, mentioned it. Okay. Well. <laughs> You're getting mixed up about where you've heard this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, well, I, I, yeah. I, I, in a way, that's a very minor thing, and it's a kind of private thing, really. I mean, I considered casting, uh, and for various reasons decided against it, really. I mean, I had worked with her before... Uh, the project before Naked was a stage play, mm. uh, which was called It's a Great Big Shame, which is the name of a famous English music hall song, uh, in which it was quite a big production, um, in which the first act was set in 1893, and was a dramatization of that musical song. And the second act was set in the same house 100 years later in 1993, which was the year we were actually working. Uh, in the first, the, the characters in, it was in the East End of London. The characters in the uh, 1893 uh, action were all white, but because of the nature of the area we were in, which is now very much a an area of black folk live in, the characters were all black in the, um, uh, in the second act. And Marianne Jean-Baptiste was actually hilarious uh, as an upwardly mobile snob of a woman who comes, who would, uh, um, demeans herself by visiting her, her sister and you know, et cetera, that stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, she's a brilliant actor and that's, the bottom line. Yeah. Um, I'll just ask a couple more questions. Maybe we can open it up to, uh, to the I audience. I mean, uh, it, it, uh, it, just to, to talk a bit specifically about uh, an aspect of the content of this film, if that's okay. <laughs> um, um, the, 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 um, the genesis of this film, or the motivation on my part, is that um, uh, two lots of people very close to me in my family adopted kids mm -hmm. and I for a number of years thought I wanted to deal with that in some way and um, when I started to look into it and think about it seriously I realized that actually what it really need, one needed to look at primarily wasn't so much the experience of those who adopt but of the adoptee mm -hmm. and the, mo the mother that has given the child away. Um, and then I discovered in the research that um, in the 1960s, a lot of white working class girls gave away mixed race kids, uh, or had them taken away, in fact, uh, to a considerable extent. And so that really, apart from anything else, was the sort of st starting point for, for what for this, for the, that motivated this film. Yeah. And I understand there was, um uh, after the film's premiere and, and after it sort of circulated a bit, there was also a phenomenon of people, uh, uh, people had been adopted who f searching out their uh, their Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I received, for a long time after the film came out, I received letters from all over the world, and it was very popular worldwide, this film. So it, it is, incidentally, my most successful film commercially, well, worldwide, um, I'd get letters from people saying, either saying, I've seen your film and I've decided to find my mother, or I've seen your film and I hope that my child will get in touch. And then they would they'd talk about the success or failure of, uh, of those um, contacts. Uh, so, yeah. And it's still, I think, it's still, it was the case, and it remains the case in many places, including quite a lot of the United States of America, it remains illegal to trace your birth mother, which I think is, uh, you know, uh, iniquitous. Yeah. And I, I've, I've also read you, uh, you talk about Secrets and Lies as a, as a film that kind of um, sums up a lot of your, a lot of your thematic uh, 
preoccupations, interests, and so on. Um, uh, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering if uh, thinking about the film now, if you still find it to be this this film that kind of um, bundles up uh, a lot of what this phase of your career was about. Um, yes, I mean, uh, it sits where it sits, and I can look at it from the point of view of subsequent experiences. I mean, it, uh, that's all I can say about it, really. I mean, I... I, I, I um, you can... I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what, where we were and what we were doing, and um, I can look at it with some perspective, but not in any way that negates, in any s sense, what we were doing. That's all I can yeah. say. And... and uh, the my last question before we, we turn to the audience, uh, I just wanted to ask about uh, your collaboration with Dick Pope, a uh, cinematographer um, who I, I think has shot nearly all of all He shot of everything from Life is Sweet onwards. Yeah. Um, and I wanted, to ask about, I wanted to ask about your collaboration here specifically because of the, um, the place of the, long, the significance of the long takes uh, uh, in this film, uh, two, of per, two of perhaps the uh, most memorable long takes in your entire career are in are in this film, um, and it's it also in addition to the cinematography, it's some of the most intricate uh, blocking, I think. Um, so I was I was hoping could you could you tell us a little bit about um, about the way the two of you sort of work together, maybe specifically in in those yes. on those scenes. Yes. Um, well, um, what we don't do, um, what I I've never done, and we regardless anathema, is we storyboard and plan everything out in advance uh, it, it, before we actually get to the location of things. Um, the procedure is that I will will have st st time, always have time in the location with the actors and the support team, but not with the crew and not with the cinematographer, and, you know, so that we can really explore in a real way through improvisation the, the, the situations, bearing in mind that the, the, the preparatory work as to who and these people are and what the premise is has already been done previously, uh, elsewhere, in a rehearsal situation. Then we'll build a scene I in the location, and then the crew, principally the cinematographer and others, will j join us. And sometimes, I can construct a piece of action, and I will say to Dick Pope, uh, I, I think it's this. And he'll say, absolutely, let's light it. And, or I might say, I think it's this. And he might say, yeah, but I was actually standing over there, and anyway, the light and what sorts of other... So we say, okay, and then we look at it, and we discuss it. Um, and so we work with the actors and the actors run it for us and we go backwards and forwards and sideways until and we decide we build the the plan of how to shoot it with reference to you're talking presumably to the scene in the cafe after um, Cynthia and Hortense have first met outside the, the uh, underground stage the tube station and the other scene you're referring to is what, the barbecue the, yeah the barbecue well the, um, it, it is um, an eight and a half minute take uh, with those two actresses. Um, I mean, anybody that works will know that simply, you know, all, all, what you have to do is what we did, which is that we constructed the scene, first of all improvising and then pinning it down and distilling it until it was precise. And then they rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it so that they could be f fly with it and it be could become completely organic and real. And we shot several takes and the best take, you know, we did actually, uh, to be honest, we did shoot reverses to cut into that thing. But as soon as we got to the um, cutting room uh, in the edit, uh, it became palpably obvious that there was absolutely no reason to in a sense spoil it with that because there it was because you know but I mean in the end the, the element I, I mean my contribution in Dick Pope's is to put the camera there and 
you know, I mean, the credit and the credit goes to those two actresses who really, really are on it. You know, they, they it's fantastic. Um, the scene where they're all sitting around the table is a whole different ball game because. Um, Apart from anything else, there's all this stuff going on with drinks and food. And I mean, you can control actors, but you can't control stakes. <laughs> I mean, they really leap about and they've got a life of their own, you know. Um, so, I mean, we, uh, 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 I knew that, that we were going to go inside because we'd constructed the entire action of the whole sequence, by the way by taking some 10 days out of the shoot and having shot four-fifths of the film. And then we had a long all-day improvisation in which there was the barbecue and all the stuff and the truth came out and all the rest of it, from which we then spent a long stretch of time building the scene. So I knew that when it, the action was going to go indoors, there was going to be a lot of cutting and, you know, so I, I felt that therefore it need, there needed to be it, it, it would be right to hold on that table with all that stuff going on. Now, there's a lot of things happening, not only physically, but there's a lot of interruptions and questions that don't get answered and uh, people um, not answering the question and changing the subject and you know, there's all sorts of and bullshit going on and stuff, you know. And all of that we built through rehearsal including everything that it happens physically. It's just a matter of taking the time and having the patience to do it, basically. So there it was, and it was pretty immaculate, apart from the stakes. <laughs> and we went, I, I, I'd gone on a recce to the house, and the back garden of the house had a fence and I knew on the other side of that fence there was a road with quite a lot of traffic going up and down. And I said to the um, location guy, um, I'm worried about the noise of the traffic because this is, you know, we're going to do live, record this, live, you know. Um, and he says, no problem, I've talked to the police and they will stop the traffic. Fine, because you can do that if, if you're lucky. Stay tuned. <laughs> because we get to the location and we start to do it and the traffic and I say what ah, the, 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 the police changed their mind <laughs> so we had to shoot it with a lot of, so therefore what you are looking at it, I mean you know post syncing dubbing getting the actors in to do it afterwards is fairly standard on all movies but I will avoid it as much as I can but um, that whole scene is completely post post sync. I mean, you know, uh, uh, but but uh, it, uh, uh, what I think is interesting because I mean, actors, some actors, a lot of actors, legitimately, come back to do that job months after they shot the scene in the movie, and they find it very hard to to, to, to reconnect with what they did or to replicate it and things. But because all those actors were so. Um, marinated in their characters and had worked uh, and their characterizations and had worked on it so thoroughly from the foundations they were all able to do it precisely and without any difficulty but it is actually um, a, a, a very um, it's an exemplary piece of post sinking actually apart from, apart from anything else yeah I'd say so <laughs> um, let's uh, let's open it up to the audience I was wondering if you could talk about the music in the film um, and just your relationship to music in your movies? Yes. I mean, this, this score is by Andrew Dixon, who um, has composed a, a lot of my films of this period. Um, and um, I, I, it's important, uh, so far as I'm concerned, to work with composers who, whose music is, uh, comes from an emotional response to the film rather than composers who can turn out movie music in a kind of um, general sort of commercial way. And Andrew Dixon is great, an idiosyncratic guy, lives down by the, on the coast in Dorset, which means I have to make a lot of journeys down there to work with him. 
um, but really an original. And uh, um, uh, you know, you talk. We, first, we, we never discuss the music on my films, and this film is no exception. Until the film is shot, until the, the, there's the earliest um, assembly of the of the material, then the composer can start to look at it and think about it and think about the voice and the kind of noise, sounds that um, he, he, he or she thinks is appropriate. And that's what Andrew did on this. And that's what, you know, uh, 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 we are very committed to having music when it has a function, not music that will push you in a direction emotionally, but music that underpins what's happening, music that uh, adds to the flavour of what's happening, uh, the emotions, not at music that overrides the action, and not wall-to-wall -wall music. And, you know, his choices of instruments, including a harp, which he'd used previously in his score for Naked, uh, which preceded this film. Um, uh, uh, gives us what we have, which is a very sensitive... Um, score. Uh, you had um, spoken about the actors who you like working with. The, yes. Uh, I was uh, wondering if you'd be able to talk about uh, the sort of actor who has trouble in uh, your process and, and how, how you <laughs> uh, identify that. Uh, to be honest, they're very few and far between. I mean, uh, in all of time, it's only, there's only been about four times that it hasn't worked out. And it's always for some uh, other reason, some things getting in that blocking what's going on, which isn't to do with the nature of what w w we're doing. I mean, I, I'm pretty, uh, I, I go to quite some lengths to check out people before I work with them. But then that's not really, even that, it, you know, there are a lot of very good people who want to do this and uh, do. Uh, uh, and so I, I can't really answer your question, really. Um, uh, 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 um, cheeky though it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there's not a lot to say about it, really. <laughs> it's fine. I, I appreciate it anyway, uh, and it's a, a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. There's a lot of parts in the dialogue that I feel like I've always connected to in your films because of all the funny sayings that are so specific to uh, being from London and families. And I want to ask about your writing process and how do you pick, when you write each character, like how do you pick uh, the funny sayings that they have and um, like the little words that kind of let you know these are normal people. We're just looking in at something that's happening anyway. Well, uh, the, the, the dialogue um, is part of the whole. How they behave, uh, what makes them tick, you know, how they what, how they um, uh, uh, be, uh, behave physically, what the physical characterizations are, uh, how they talk, what motivates them when they talk, and what kind of uh, where they're from and wh 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 what, um, therefore, you know, what is their dialect or what is their usage, um, how educated, and all those things. Because we create the, these characters in a completely three-dimensional way, including doing all, all actors in all of my projects, this is no exception, do a massive amount of research into anything and everything you can think of. I mean, you could be quite sure that Timothy Spall uh, went out and learnt about being a high street photographer. Marianne Jean Baptiste went and did a crash course in optometry, etc., etc. Um, everybody does that. People know, you know. People read the books the characters read, sees the movies they've seen, listen to the music they listen to, thought of or research where they can, where they've been on holiday. You know everything, and. Uh, and that includes being very specific about uh, a character's background and class and education and, or lack of, or whatever it is. And that, of course, it, part and parcel of that is the language that they use to express themselves. So it, 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 if I'm answering your question, if I think 
I understand your question. Um, it, it's, it, it's not a matter of kind of just the dialogue by itself. It's part of the organic whole. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sometimes it seems in when watching films that um, the, the writer has assembled a, a list of traits that they've given a character, and yes, they might have a memorable personality, but there's something of a soul or it's something deeper that's under the surface that's less readily identifiable. Um, and uh, perhaps you already did answer that, uh, but I was wondering if more in the writing process, because you were talking about how the actors approach the characters in the writing, um, is there something that you attend to in particular? Well, yes. I mean, the, the, what, the, the writing is the... The writing, which is, is the definition of everything that's happening, including what people say, um, the is the final um, conversion of the thing into a finished artifact. It, uh, um, that's the job. Um, uh, uh, and with that, if I'm focusing on what you're talking about, with that come all those um, the decisions that uh, are what's behind what you're talking about. Uh, um, I think that's what I can say about that, really. I mean, it, I, 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 I can't talk about the writing as a separate thing mm. because the writing is the creation of the, of the whole. I mean, obviously, write, liter, literary writing considerations come into it from my point of view. I mean, I'm very, very on, on the case about, you know, the precision of language and the of what's being said and what isn't being said and all of those things. Uh, but we arrive at that uh, with the, uh, uh, through the processes that I've been talking about. But the, right, the actual literary aspect of the writing is very important, certainly. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. All right, so we can, I think we have time for at least one more. Yeah, we'll stay on that side of the room over there. I am someone who experienced what some of those characters experienced with having a child when I was a teenager and being forced to vanish and have a child and have it adopted. So I was very moved by this. I saw it when it first came out because I'm 70 something now. <laughs> and um, I just was so moved by the fact that this is such a salient issue right now, especially in the United States with the whole issue of abortion and people arguing about babies and what they should do with them and they give them up. And um, I just feel like everybody should see this movie now. I feel like it's really an important film. I, I'm wondering if you've had that kind of feeling yourself. I, I, I appreciate what you say and I agree. Um, more than that, my other film, which is also being shown here, Vera Drake, which is about, <laughs> thank you which, as you know, is about um, a backstreet abortionist in London in the time before the 1967 Abortion Act. I think that film should be on general release all over the United States. Um, <laughs> given what's happening currently, obviously. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, thank you for what you say. I, um, it's nice to hear it said. It's good to be saying, and I think you're right. And we, we have to leave it there, but Mike will be back tomorrow for Topsy Turvy, so hopefully we'll see you there. And Mike, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.